What I'm going to do today is I'm actually going to follow up on what uh, Gordon Hansen has been discussing uh, in terms of United States and some other industrialized countries and try to give you a sense of what we have learned over the past um, 25 years about how trade policy changes affect um, income distribution uh, in uh, developing countries. Uh, one thing that I want to emphasize from the start is that uh, it's not just the economists who agree that there are um, aggregate gains from trade. Even when we ask uh, individuals in developing and developed countries uh, whether or not uh, trade and business ties are good for their country, uh, what's striking is that the majority of people, both in lower income countries as well as high income countries, agree that uh, there are aggr aggregate benefits uh, uh, from trade. This is data from a Global Attitude Survey, uh, and basically it plots a um, share of individuals in a country that uh, say that uh, trade is good for their country against the GDP per capita. And you see at all levels of income, uh, uh, ma majority agrees that trade is good. Where we find more disagreement is when these same individuals are asked uh, how trade impacts uh, livelihood of workers. So the, the, the graph here uh, ask, uh, shows the share of individuals in a particular country uh, that say that trade uh, lowers wages uh, in the top left corner, uh, trade uh, destroys jobs in the bottom, uh, in the bottom corner, uh, as well as uh, say tr trade raises wages or tr uh, says that trade uh, creates jobs. And you see that individuals in lower income countries are much more likely to say that uh, trade raises wages and creates jobs, whereas uh, uh, individuals in higher income countries are more likely to say that trade uh, lowers wages and destroys jobs. Uh, in both of these uh, graphs, what's interesting to see is what, how much of an outlier United States uh, is. Um, uh, so what I'm going to do uh, today is I'm going to give you uh, a sense of what we have learned uh, over the past 25 years uh, in terms of winners and losers of international trade. As Gordon mentioned, economists have long known that trade generates winners uh, and losers. And what's important to remember that this happens in developed countries as well as developing countries. And the second thing that I want to mention is that we... In economic models, uh, even those that um, do not have any frictions on the labor market mobility or any frictions in the credit market, we get predictions that trade will uh, generate winners and losers. And the Hexerolean model is uh, you know, an example of, of such setting. And what that model, which has guided policy prescriptions on trade, would predict for developing countries is that um, trade was predicted to benefit the less educated workers uh, and hurt the more educated workers in developing countries. So in a sense, uh, what trade was predicted to do is generate aggregate gains in low-income countries uh, and simultaneously reduce poverty because the less educated tended to be uh, poorer than more educated ones, and also by um, decreasing the wage gap between more educated and less educated, reduce inequality. What we have learned uh, since the 1990s uh, through numerous studies is that cumulative evidence uh, on the effects of trade on uh, labor markets in developing countries is much more uh, nuanced. Uh, you know, by now, uh, developing countries account for over 40% of world trade. And this um, integration of developing countries into the global market was in part driven by uh, many large-scale trade policy changes that these countries implemented, or uh, policy changes that were implemented by their trading partners, as well as the integration of China. So uh, unlike um, work for developed countries, where we really kind of had to wait for this large shock that China represented to, uh, to trade trading patterns, patterns of countries like United States. In developing countries, we had many natural experiments that we could study with very detailed data on workers and, uh, and farms to understand how international trade, either through um, import liberalizations or through providing increased access to export markets, has shaped uh, earnings and employment of opportunities of individuals uh, in, uh, in developing countries. So one important thing to keep in mind as we go through this literature is that in mo most studies in developed countries really focus on importing shocks, whereas in developing countries we really have many studies that look both at you know, the impact of importing shocks, where importing shocks can be well identified, as well as impacts where exporting shocks can be uh, well identified. In reality, you know, because of general equilibrium, importing and exporting shocks are happening simultaneously. It's just that like in some of, you know, when I'm going to be focusing on importing versus exporting, 
all I'm doing is I'm focusing on a setting when one versus the other can be better identified. But keep in mind, in reality, all these things are happening at the same time uh, within a country. Uh, so what have we learned? So number one thing that comes from this literature is that increased international trade is not the main reason for the increased wage inequality in developing countries. And this conclusion comes from kind of reduced um, uh, form studies that uh, Penny Goldberg and I have uh, surveyed, uh, uh, as well as more quantitative work that, uh, that Elhanan Helpman uh, has, uh, has surveyed. Um, However, we should not ignore distributional com um, uh, consequences of trade because trade policy does matter for earnings, it does matter for employment opportunities that workers have, and through that it does shape poverty and equality. However, we should, uh, you know, what, what we have learned is that there are no simple uh, answers to questions such as, is trade good for the poor? Or does trade increase inequality? Those questions are actually very nuanced. Those answers to those questions are very nuanced and context specific. They will depend on the type of uh, changes in trade policy that, uh, or trade patterns that a uh, country is implementing. And they will depend on the e economic mechanisms uh, that are most relevant in that particular circumstance. They, the other thing that we learned uh, is that they, matter, uh, they really depend a lot on how mobile workers and capitals are across firms, across industries, and uh, as Gordon uh, uh, focused on in developed countries, across geographic uh, locations. And the third thing that will really matter is like, you know, where in the income distributions are these individuals that are being most affected by, uh, by trade reform. Uh, so let me give you, uh, you know, some uh, snapshots of specific, uh, more, you know, more specific details from this literature. Uh, you know, in the past, you know, we either focused on um, uh, how workers' um, skills or education affect uh, their uh, uh, um, matters for how they are affected by trade or industry affiliation. What we have learned over the past 20 years is that workers' firm affiliation matters as well. Uh, we know now that firms differ quite a bit in terms of their performance within narrowly uh, defined industries. And we also know that better perf performing firms tend to pay uh, their workers uh, more. Um, and the, the third thing that we learned is that better uh, performing firms are better positioned to deal with uh, the challenges of import competition, as well as they are better positioned to take advantage uh, of new exporting opportunities. So through that, uh, international trade basically exacerbates initial earning differences between workers uh, that work in better performing work uh, firms and uh, worse performing uh, firms. Let me just give you a couple examples there. For example, we have literature that shows that um, uh, you know, in import competing industries, which will be suffering from increased uh, import competition, declines in uh, uh, industry employment tend to be very concentrated in less productive uh, firms. And that we have uh, evidence on that from uh, developing countries. There is, you know, the import competition increases uh, exit and declines in uh, unemployment, as well as uh, Gordon mentioned in developed uh, countries. Uh, on the exporting side, we also know that exporting increases wage inequality between uh, workers that work in better and worse performing firms. Well, why? Because better performing firms already pay better, and on top of that, when uh, firms, companies have opportunity to engage in uh, new exporting opportunities, uh, the better performing ones are the ones who take, can take advantage of those more, and uh, these, uh, they uh, basically share their revenue gains or profit gains with the workers that are employed in them, okay? However, uh, it's not just that worker firm affiliation matters, worker education does matter as well. And uh, we, you know, in the past, we thought that less educated workers are gonna be benefiting from traderization episodes, but what we find is that the skills that more educated workers uh, have are actually uh, also in higher demand when firms want to export uh, from developing countries. And the reason why that's happening is that oftentimes when uh, firms want to export to richer countries from developing countries, uh, consumers in high uh, uh, income countries demand quality and produ production of quality uh, uh, requires skill. Okay, so basically trade also uh, uh, increases the wage gap between more educated and less educated through that channel. The main thing, though, that I want to uh, mention here is that all these uh, f findings that I just uh, mentioned applied to workers that uh, work in formal registered manufacturing firms. Okay? And the great thing about these findings is that they simultaneously show how firms are adjusting to uh, globalization shocks and how this affects workers. But what we don't see is what happens to workers that have lost jobs. 
because you, know, you just can't see that in this sort of data set. The other thing that uh, we can see and uh, that uh, is important is that this, this sort of data that generated this finding suggests that uh, it's basically representative of a really small share of labor force in developing countries. Uh, so even when we just focus on manufacturing, formal registered firms employ 70% of manufacturing workers in Brazil, only 20% of manufacturing workers in India, and about 42% of manufacturing workers in Vietnam. And we know that in many of these countries, agriculture and services is where most of the employment is. Okay? So, uh, and on top of that, we know that people who tend to select into these formal manufacturing jobs you know, tend, to be more, uh, tend to be more educated. So what's key to understanding how trade affects um, uh, labor markets in developing countries, we really need to look beyond uh, formal uh, employers in formal registered uh, firms in manufacturing because we, we do know that informal sector, or like we can call it just self-employment, accounts for a vast share of employment in low-income countries. And that's, uh, you know, in part that happens from um, family farms and also uh, informal uh, firms in manufacturing and services. And if we think about kind of the stories we have in the back of our mind, how trade could reduce poverty, the usual stories is that like, you know, trade allows people to move from informal establishments to more formal ones, uh, which tend to be more productive, or enables people to move out of kind of self-subsistence uh, agriculture to more, uh, more productive uh, um, uh, activities. So fortunately, we have actually a couple studies that have shown that, you know, that trade has contributed to this process. The first one is a study by uh, Bilge Ayrton and Jessica Light that has shown how China's WTO accession affects uh, structural transformation, movement of workers out of agriculture to manufacturing uh, in, uh, in China. Uh, you, can see it, uh, you can see that after uh, China's entry into WTO, which is denoted uh, by the uh, line in uh, 2001, um, Employment in uh, uh, agriculture has dropped quite a bit, whereas you know, employment in services manufacturing has been growing. What they do is they basically take advantage of the fact that different counties within China were more or less exposed to uh, declines and uncertainty about US trade policy as a result of uh, China's WTO ent uh, entry. And what they find is that counties in China that were more exposed to these reduction in US uncertainty experience, so in a sense they had like a positive export shock, increase exports and FDI. Uh, they, uh, they have relative expansion uh, of employment in manufacturing and mining, and actual absolute contraction of employment in invest uh, and investment in agricultural sector as well as increases in total and per capita GDP. And we know that, you know, basically the best way to get people out of poverty is through, uh, through, uh, through economic uh, growth. So this, you know, this is something that we would miss if we would be just focusing on manufact formal manufacturing firms. Uh, similar, you know, similarly, uh, some work that I've done with Brian McKegg on Vietnam uh, 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 that focuses on the consequences of U.S.-Vietnam bilateral trade agreement, which mainly reduced import taxes on Vietnamese exports to the United States, so really uh, made it much cheaper for uh, Vietnamese firms to export to the United States. Uh, that, uh, that agreement uh, actually enabled um, uh, enabled Vietnamese workers to move out of the informal uh, sector to more formal, uh, to more formal uh, jobs. Uh, what we found there is that, you know, basically exporting influenced labor market outcomes of workers way beyond uh, formal manufacturing. In particular, these export opportunities promoted workers to move out of these micro-enterprises to more formal uh, uh, sector. And it's not, and what's really important with, uh, about that is that when you, as a worker, you shift from to formal sector, that really changes how attached you are to the labor force. In particular, you tend to work longer and more regular hours. You are less likely to hold multiple jobs. You have higher earnings. In the case of Vietnam, uh, you also receive higher benefits. And what's interesting is that you know, stable jobs tend to be the, kind of the main characteristic of being in the middle class in, uh, in these developing countries, as a kind of survey of, uh, by uh, Banerjee and Duflo uh, has shown. Okay? Uh, again, these, uh, you know, these um, uh, F kind of positive influences of international trade uh, on labor markets would have been missed if we just focused on uh, formal manufacturing uh, alone. Uh, the, the third thing that I want to emphasize is that like in developed countries, uh, also in developing countries, trade has a highly geographically concentrated effects. 
Uh, what's, diff what's a little bit different in uh, developing countries relative to the work that, uh, that um, Gordon has shown is that we actually have many instances where people were able to evaluate the consequences of exporting as well as importing on local labor markets uh, in developing countries. And what these studies have shown in many contexts, you know, ranging from India, Brazil, Mexico, Vietnam, China, and South uh, Africa, is that if you're an individual in a region that has high concentration of industry that's benefiting from uh, lower exporting costs, you will fare better than individuals in less exposed regions. And on, on the other side, if you're an individual that lives in a region that uh, where uh, industries um, are mainly concentrated in uh, import, uh, import competing sectors, you will fare worse than individuals in less exposed regions. So as economists, we would think, well, why don't people then just move from you know, low paying to high paying uh, uh, regions? Uh, we actually do have some evidence that people do move toward better opportunities, uh, especially like we have that evidence from uh, in Vietnam and in, uh, in China. However, we have a lot of evidence that suggests it's really hard for individuals to move out of areas that were adversely hit by, uh, by, uh, by uh, imp import competing uh, shocks. And that imperfect inter-regional mobility uh, you know, lasts anywhere from five to nine years, uh, for example, nine years in India, and, uh, and like in, in, in places where we actually have data that goes, uh, you know, that go, where we can follow workers for even longer t uh, periods of time, even up to 20 years. So this imperfect labor mobility is, uh, is, is precluding people from taking advantage of uh, uh, new jobs in places where exporting generates these uh, new, uh, new jobs. Uh, Again, a good example of, uh, area, uh, of uh, places where we can identify the benefits of exporting opportunities, these concentrated benefits of export opportunities in Vietnam, uh, uh, work by my uh, co-author Brian McKegg, um, and our follow-up work has shown that in Vietnam, as a, uh, you know, during the 2000s, aggregate poverty was declining everywhere. However, if you lived, if you were a family that lived in province uh, that had a high concentration of exporting industries that benefited from, for example, U.S.-Vietnam bilateral trade agreement, these families and workers observed bigger increases in wages, especially if you were less educated workers. Uh, you know, as I mentioned before, people were moving from informal to formal sector, and there actually were declines in household uh, poverty, and some people were moving into these provinces. Maybe part of the reason why in Vietnam this transition uh, uh, happened is that Vietnam, when Vietnam was hit by these globalization shocks, it had a relatively young population, and Vietnam, relative for its level of development, actually had much more educated population than countries at similar stages uh, of, of development. And we know from other literature that younger and more, more educated workers, uh, you know, basically can more easily adjust to uh, various shock. But let's now look at the concentrated losses, which could be, you know, well identified in India's 1991 import liberalization. So, you know, the main policy change here was reduction in import bar domestic import barriers. Um, Again, we know that during this time period, for various reasons, aggregate poverty in India was declining. However, if you were a family living in a district that was harder hit by uh, import competition, you experienced relative declines in industry wages, declines in agricultural wages, and increases in poverty. And in p the part of the reason for that is that there was very uh, low inter-district mobility of employment even nine years after onset of reform. And you know, uh, th this has been shown in very path-breaking uh, work by Petya Topalova in 2007 and uh, 2010 papers. She shows that basically less than 1% of rural individuals moved uh, uh, within 10 years of trade reform, less than 5% in the urban area. Uh, uh, people didn't, you know, the out migration was not correlated with the trade shock, and mobility was particularly low for, for the poor. And what she showed in her uh, work is that part of the reason why this mobility was low was were rigid labor markets, uh, combined with some evidence that uh, work by uh, Kaivan Munshi and uh, Rosenzweig has, uh, has shown. Uh, 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 that, that shows that part of the reason why people in India don't move so much is because they rely on informal social networks uh, uh, within castes uh, for, uh, for social, uh, social uh, protection, which provides this incentive to move away. So here you see that you know, how trade is going to be affecting individuals depends in part on the demographics, for example, in Vietnam, as well as kind of social norms uh, uh, in, uh, in, in the uh, society. 
Uh, the, the, the third thing that I want to mention, uh, the next thing that I want to mention here is that these adverse uh, uh, trade shocks can actually spill over to uh, intergenerational consequences and for that reason be uh, more long uh, lasting. Um, uh, in, in some work with uh, Eric Edmonds, as well as uh, work with Petya Tupalova, we have shown that one of the main channels through which trade affects schooling and child labor choices of uh, families in low-income countries is family income. So in the case of Indian families and 1991 liberalization, uh, families in hard hit regions experienced ne uh, relative um, negative income shocks, okay? And what that meant is that school age children, so these are children that, uh, that attend primary school, so you know, ages six to 14, and especially girls, uh, experience relative declines in school attendance, declines in school completion rates and literacy, and also that which translates into declines in lifelong, uh, lifelong uh, income. So this shows that like, you know, uh, uh, you know a negative shock to fa parental income can, can have spillover effects for the uh, next generation and perpetuates, uh, uh, perpetuates inequalities from, uh, through that channel. Uh, the final thing that I actually want to mention is that these adverse effects of import competition uh, are actually very persistent and can actually get bigger with time. So, uh, you know, Gordon's work uh, with uh, David Otter and, uh, uh, um, and uh, David Dorn for United States provides some evidence for that. Another, uh, the second study we have uh, on these uh, ampl amplification effects uh, come from Brazil uh, and work by uh, Rafael Dix Carneiro and Brian Kovac. They actually can follow workers like up to 20 years uh, following uh, Brazil's uh, domestic import liberalization in 91. And what they show is that basically the negative effects on workers' earning and employment and opportunities right after trade reform actually become bigger with time. And part of the reason why that's happening is because people are not moving enough out of the negatively affected areas. Part of it is happening because of negative agglomeration economies. But part of it is happening because capital is adjusting uh, really, uh, really slowly. So unfortunately, they can't measure capital directly, but they can uh, actually measure uh, uh, plant entry and exit uh, directly. And what they show here is that, uh, if you look at the, um, uh, the, the first graph there, is that you know, trade reform decreases establishment uh, size uh, over time. But what you see is that the trade reform actually reduces the number of former establishments, but the, initially just a little bit, because if you made investments into your plant, you want the capital to depreciate. Firms only slowly exit the market. And you see how number of former establishments only slowly decreases with time. That, in part, reflects two things. It reflects that basically there's less entry in this more negatively of firms uh, into these negatively affected areas, and then there's this slow response of firm exit. And that uh, uh, translates into decline in job creation as well as increase in uh, job de destruction that kind of increases with time because capital is adjusting slowly. And that's related to kind of the plant, uh, uh, plant exit results uh, for developed countries. Okay. So in, to conclude, uh, I want to emphasize that it's not just the economists that agree they are aggregates from trade, even public does. But we also need to, you know, much more, uh, uh, we want to do a better job acknowledges that these gains are very unevenly distributed, uh, both in developed and developing countries. Uh, we, you know, we also now know, you know, that employment law, uh, you know, that we have pretty large employment losses from import competition. However, I'm always surprised how much uh, how, how much uh, attention we, we, fo uh, we spent focusing on those. In a sense, those are not surprising. They are concerning, but they're not surprises. We always knew that trade would create jobs and trade would destroy jobs. And that's the same thing that changes in consumer tastes do, uh, changes in technology do. It's, you know, it, it's, a, it's, an, um, it's a characteristic of a healthy, dynamic economy. What's more concerning that we have learned from this literature is that uh, in the United States and in developing countries, uh, the geographic losses are, um, you know, are very highly concentrated and they are persistent over time. Uh, there is very little uh, adjustment of displaced wo uh, workers to initial trade policy changes and that these labor market consequences have spillovers to other community incomes, including education of um, uh, next generation. Thank you. <laughs>